Uh, today's passage uh, scripture reading is from Acts chapter 20, verse 1 through 6. And in your pew Bible, that is page 929. Um, before I start reading from chapter um, 20 of uh, Acts, I just want to let you know what I'm wearing, because obviously it looks kind of strange and different. Um, it's just kind of helped to set up a pastor's illustration a little bit later on. Uh, it's from the country of Jordan. It's called a hutta. In a very simplistic translation, it means hat. Uh, I'm not wearing it on my head uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, today, in a, traditionally, a long time ago, they might have worn it on their head for many different reasons uh, that are helpful for the region with this, the sand and the wind and the, and the desert, that kind of stuff. Uh, today, it's more of a very iconic thing. So much as, as much as we might you know, have our American flags around, they'll have their, um, their hot toes. Uh, but the youth today, they wear a lot of gel, some faux hawks and stuff on their head. Um, it really messes up the hair, so they just put it around their neck. So that's basically how that works out. So anyway, if, uh, if you can, uh, stand with me for the reading of the word from Acts chapter 20, verse 1 through 6. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions, he had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater, the Berean, son of Perias, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Thank you. You may be seated. We go all over here. If you need, you'd come up, and Sarah, if you'd make your way up, we'll get a microphone here. The reason I asked uh, James and Eugenie and Sarah to be a part of this. Uh, James is married to Eugenie, and she's from Jordan, and Sarah had opportunity to spend some time in the Middle East um, because uh, they have some knowledge of Middle Eastern culture, and the Bible was written in Middle Eastern culture. It, culture, it is Asian, it is not necessarily European. It has become European because we've been blessed in the West to receive Christ. So some of the things that um, we bring into the context, we may read into it. Even as I was doing the bride um, groom um, illustration, there may have been things that a person from an Asian culture would look at that story differently. Uh, so anyways, so the reason I wanted to kind of get the ball rolling and James to kind of get it started, and then Eugenie and Sarah, as you'd like to jump in concerning it, that's fine. But the question I was asking is, just when people greet one another, um, when people are uh, coming into a room or into a family or into a, a house or whatever, how does that play out um, for the person? How do, what, yeah, just answer that question. I don't know if that is too general. Well, I guess in a general, yeah, can you hear? All right, so in a very simplistic answer, I guess, in that it's a process. So it's, uh, you know, when you walk into a room and you visit somebody, or if it's holidays, you know, it's mandatory that you visit everybody in the family. You come in, you know, everybody stands, you go through a line, you greet everybody, and uh, then when you leave, again, it's a process. It takes time uh, to make sure that everyone has said goodbye to everybody and, and greeted, uh, not just in words, but also, you know, physically greeted. Okay, so what would that look like? James, you enter a room, uh, men are in the room and women are in the room. How does that play out for you? Who, who, what does that look like? Okay. So it, it, well, that would depend on, on the, I guess, the room. Uh, now, in, in Eugenie's case, if I was visiting family with her, uh, because now I'm, I'm related, uh, generally, most everybody, I can shake hands and then also would kiss. So one on, one on each side. Uh, and in, in, with women, it would be more so, it would have to be related. It needs to be, generally, it would be older women, uh, younger women, you know. Sarah and I, there would be no kissing. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> and, and Jason likes that. Um, He's getting up on yeah, his Yeah, yeah, um, so, but yeah. But we were talking a little bit with... Um, but Eugenie. definitely every guy. You don't even have to know the guy or not. You can kiss him. Okay. It's okay. Okay. And Eugenie, you, uh, you, you said that your grandma, oh, you were talking about your grandma or somebody that you love. How does that look? What does that look like? 
uh, greeting her or uh, also the, the ladies that they really loved me and they wanted to show their love. They will kiss one here and multiple kisses here. <laughs> so this is how they show their love. So th this is with all the, all, all the lady mostly, but like for younger lady, we don't kiss a lot. We just like on occasionally and family, when we do visit them, we, we do the kisses. But with men, we just shake hands. Okay. J just woman to woman. Okay. Um, Sarah, Sarah had the opportunity to live in Egypt uh, for a few months and then tour some of the Middle Eastern countries, but you lived with a Muslim family in Egypt. Would you tell us what um, your first interaction, how you walk into this household, what, what was it like? Yeah, uh, there was a girl named Rasha and she was the youngest daughter of the family. There was nine girls in the family and she was the youngest and she was the one who wasn't married. All the other ones did have spouses and children and stuff and so she really latched on to me. We were only three years apart and within like the first hour of knowing her she told me all about herself and then she would when we'd be walking to the street she'd be holding my hand and whenever she'd be whenever we'd be having a conversation she'd be sitting right next to me on the couch and holding my arm or like grabbing me when she's laughing which is really good for me because I'm always grabbing people when I'm laughing and so I fit right in um but the thing that's neat about the culture is that it is a very physical embraceive I mean, um, yeah, embracing culture. And so, like, I didn't necessarily have that with the men. The men, I would shake their hand, and it's a very limp handshake. And that's actually, like, showing them respect is that I'm doing it very limp, which is so different than how it is in America. If someone gave you a limp handshake, it would be, like, gross. But there, it's like, I'm showing you respect. And I always forgot, so I'd always, like, crush their hand on accident. Um, so, yeah, they – and so the men also could hold hands. Like, they could walk down the street and hold hands. And it wasn't a thing about – um, sexuality it was that they're having conversation and they're close to one another and they're good friends and so um, yeah they could be holding hands or riding motorcycles together um, and women could be holding hands and the only time men and women held hands was if they were engaged or if they were married so yeah it was just there's a lot of physical affection towards one another mm -hmm. and so when you when you walk into a room and there are people there do you have to greet everyone would you greet everyone I was like such a foreigner and so everyone like everyone was really nice to me but but, um, pe like the women would always come over to me and greet me, but the men would just say hello or shake my hand. But I didn't have to greet everyone just okay. because they everyone understood. was like, you don't know what's going on. And so okay. they didn't overwhelm me. Okay. Um, oh, and the other thing that you had asked me about was like, they also were very verbally affectionate, um, like saying how much they loved me and how much they were going to miss me. Like all the time, they just, oh, wash me, which is, I miss you, like, I love you, and so, like, they just would say it all the time to me, and so, like, and they'd only, I'd only lived with them for a week, and so I don't know how many people you have be in your house for a week, and then at the end of it, you're wanting to tell them how much you're going to miss them and love them. I don't know if you guys have that when people stay at your house for a week, but that's how they treated me, mm -hmm. so. And James, you told us about a guy who right away was holding your hand. What, tell them that story. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was part of an event uh, with uh, the United States uh, Aid for International Development, and it was a big, it was the uh, International Youth Day that they hosted in Jordan, and so we were actually outside of the city. So that actually makes, you know, if you're talking, you know, different countries, Jordan and Egypt, but also when you're talking uh, metropolitan versus uh, the countryside, that makes a big difference. Uh, you know, the, the cities seem to westernize everything, and everybody becomes busy and, and, and less relational, but so... The, the event was, was in a smaller town, and the, the people were more uh, what they call uh, Bedouin, which are tent people, but uh, historically they live in homes now. But uh, so they just, you know, they hadn't, you know, hadn't seen an American. Some, a lot of them didn't speak very much English because they were outside of the city. And so, it, you know, they were just all flocking to me to hear what I had to say. I was the one American at this U.S. sponsored event and, uh, you know, taking pictures. And they were like, here's our hero. You know, he's the one who brought us all the money. And I'm like, no. no. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I was just standing there. And, you know, the guys were just coming up and lock fingers and just hold. <laughs> He's my friend, you know, and I was like, you know, and, it was, and, I, and I expected that to happen at some point, uh, but it was it, after a little while, you know, 10 minutes going on, you're, you get a little awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. okay. Is there anything else concerning um, just how much it means to you and how much it means to somebody from that culture when they receive that? What have you picked up from that, James, as a, as a Westerner coming into that and you... Uh, what, what is their perception of us and how we greet, or is it even an issue? 
There were a lot of questions in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> go, go. Um, their perception, I guess, of us, I think, I think Sarah touched on a little bit. Like, you know, they weren't expecting you to know everything and to greet everybody necessarily as the foreigner. And I think a lot of that would happen too with me because I don't even, you know, especially when I first get there, I don't know what anybody's saying. Uh, they, so they wouldn't necessarily expect that. And I can see that with, you know, Eugenia's family, that if I didn't do that, it probably would be okay. But at the same time, I just went ahead and, you know, jumped in line with everybody else. The, you know, they, they absolutely love that. So uh, it, because they were bringing me into a family rather than, rather than just being a visitor, you know, there was a, there was a lot more um, involved in that. So I, they, they understand, you know, when Americans come, they're not necessarily as... Uh, but if you when you when you do that when you partake in that they just it just it means so much um, to them. It's 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 interesting because a lot of times you know things in our own customs and traditions you wouldn't say maybe we're, we're traditional in a sense, but if something's missing from what you normally do, it's noticeable. Mm. You know if something just continues on you know okay you kiss you hug you whatever however you greet you know even here if you shake hands if you don't shake hands however you do it if it just continues to happen you don't don't notice it until it's missing. And so if you're the one guy who's not shaking, you know, and hugging and whatever, then it feels awkward. Okay. So you just kind of jump in and, and hang okay. out with them. So. All right. Anything else that you ladies want to add to it at all? Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, Eugenie just wanted to share, like, with any kind of event, like a wedding, uh, I mean, those are, again, another important point and place where, I mean, everybody gets in line and shakes and kisses, and it's just, you know, I, I, I had kisses from people I've never seen before, so. Uh, <laughs> and something that you mentioned as we were talking, we talked in the office before this, um, as I was doing study for this, this passage of Scripture and the love that was shown, some cultures in biblical times, let's say, you spent that week with somebody out of love you're leaving they would actually travel with you a day and a half on your journey and then ultimately say goodbye to you and then head back home what does that say to us about values or you were saying something in the office about that okay yeah i was just mentioning you know as far as values like you know we it was it was brought up you know we might think well that's not very efficient you know that's a waste of time to spend so much time saying goodbye and i don't know sarah said well you know at that time you don't have tv that takes up a lot of time and all these other things that we're distracted with but at the same time they would look at it uh with that is being productive that is efficient because what is the one thing that lasts forever people you know so why not put as much time and effort and efficiency in developing those relationships that will continue on um, into the next life rather than our stuff um, so it's, it's just very different like even today you know they're not necessarily travel for a day and a half to get somewhere you got a car you can get there in 30 minutes but they're going to walk you out the door down the sidewalk to your car um, every time uh, even after you, you called me and asked, you know, if we would do this, the one thing I mentioned, you know, when we were talking with Eugenie about is that when you go to leave the country, if you especially have been there for a long time, is you have to make sure you're packed a week ahead of time. Because for the whole week before you leave, your house is going to be just, you know, invaded by people coming in, wanting to say goodbye, giving you gifts, thinking that you're going to take 10 bags of luggage of gifts with you. And, uh, and then, of course, when people visit you, it's polite to go back and visit them. So uh, there's just, it's just a very, very long process of, of saying goodbye and making sure, you know, I mean, you know, dealing with, you know, homesickness, you know, Jeannie's going through that whole process. But, you know, every time I bring that, it comes up, you know, I'm like, well, you know, you're loved. I mean, no, it wasn't a person who didn't show you that, you know, you were loved before we left. You know, there wasn't anybody. You know, sometimes I don't know if anybody's ever moved or left or gone somewhere, and, and there was one person that somehow got slipped through. You didn't get to say goodbye to, and it just it weighs heavy on you. But if you had the chance and you get to say goodbye to everybody, you feel fulfilled before you can move on and go to the next place. Amen. So Thank you. Thank, thank them for taking the time to do it. Thank you, James, very much. This, this whole, uh, there's so much to different cultures that even as Cassie was sharing in Sunday school about their, their response to guests and visitors and how they were saying things like, oh, thank you for our visitors and the hospitality. I just want to learn that. I want to, 
uh, I love being American. I want you to know. Uh, there, there were times, I think, early on, I, was so, I thought this was patriotism. You know, we're right. And everything we do, we got it figured out, you know. And I don't think that's necessarily good. Um, and it isn't good. But I love this country. I, I was telling Sarah the other day, I can listen to the Gettysburg Address and just my, I'm moved already, okay. Um, I can see Mr. Smith goes to Washington and, and uh, Jimmy Stewart, you know, just interacting with our patriotic things, and I'm moved. But I want to be a person that responds uh, to things biblically and even things that I'm, aren't necessarily me. Because some of you might be going, I would never work in that culture. I'm just not a hugger and stuff. Well, you've got to figure there's probably people like you in that culture. Now, I don't know if he's the grumpy old man in the corner and they just consider, oh, that's the Arab that won't hug us. All right. But the thing is, I think that we do things culturally and I think God's called us to even be above culture and to respond to things biblically. And uh, I think some of the mess that we might be getting in is because maybe we aren't um, loving people in a, in a tangible way, and, uh, but purely. I was, we did a mission trip when I was in Illinois as a youth pastor back in 96 to Arabic Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., which had uh, people from Lebanon and Syria and Egypt and, and Jordan and all these people that were meeting, congregating, and we, we were talking, and on Sunday they were interacting, and they're all hugging each other and kissing each other, and even between the genders. And uh, at some point I'm thinking, now what's up with this? And the thing that I think was concerned about is what about the guy who just wants to just start touching women, all right? And I asked this guy, Riyadh was his name, and I said, how do you deal with that? And he said, I said, because I'm seeing it all over the place, and he goes, we know the difference. <laughs> and I was like, all right, Riyadh, we got that figured out. All right. And I think, let's, if your heart is right, because I, I tell, think of the different ones of you as I'm interacting with you, um, people that I come in contact with, I want to love people deeply. And we're not all the same. But I see a biblical pattern here. Let's look through some of these scriptures. We've only got six verses, so if you're worried about the clock, um, I want you to see, uh, we're going to get through this, but I want you to see this is a pattern in the scriptures, um, not just culturally, but I think God is saying that this is how we respond. We respond to people. He said uh, this is the story of Israel or Jacob as, as he's getting close to his death. Now the eyes of Israel or Jacob were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them, his sons, to be blessed near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. So you can see that as a grandfather would be doing that. That's, that's a normal thing. I hope that's a, a, a normal thing. And it should be um, in our lives as our kids. I hope our children know that they're loved. I, I, um, my dad wasn't one of these demonstrative type of people. Um, I think sometimes men, we need to push ourselves a little bit. I think that our children need to see interaction between husband and wife that's healthy, um, that they see affection. I think sometimes we're worried about, oh, I don't know how this is going to be perceived. I think it's a great thing. I would have loved to see my parents hug one another to know that they are uh, loving one another. And so we see, you see this in Scripture. 1 Samuel 20, 41 and 42, we see this David and Jonathan story. And as soon as the boy had gone, which is the, the, um, the one that was chasing after the arrows, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face because he had, he had said, I think your dad hates me, talking to Jonathan. And Jonathan's like, no, no, my dad, my dad and you are all right and stuff like that. He goes, no, 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 I want, I'll Wait. And later, and so he hid, and there was a, a secret message that he was able to find out that, oh, man, my dad, who is King Saul, does hate David, and so I've got to send a message to him. Don't come to the palace because you are a, you're dead if you do. And so this, these two friends love one another, and they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be, bet be between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. But there is a love there that is seen that is pure. And I, and I think that because 
of the times we're living in, men hesitate to show love toward a, another man in a clean, perfectly fine way because it's like, oh, I don't want to look like I'm gay. And the reality is sometimes we're missing out because we say, I'm going to be so protective on things that I'm not willing to make this person aware of, hey, I I care deeply for you. And God understands uh, the practicality of some of these things in culture. I see this in this passage. Look at the Luke 10, 1 through 4 passage. Look at this. After this, remember that Jesus sends them out. Luke, uh, Lord, appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of woods, wolves, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and this is the part that would kind of be confusing to you, and greet no one on the road. Here's why he says that. He knows what the culture is like. So he knows if you start, stop and start greeting people, you're going to be taking up time because they just mentioned it. You got to greet everybody, and it takes time. And so he goes efficient and we're moving things through and so I want you to know and ultimately you're going to stop and stay with somebody but he understood culture enough to know that that was the reality and so he's saying move on look at this in John 13 21 through 25 and I, I want you to notice that John is proud of this he's so happy that this is the case and because John wrote this after saying these things Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified truly truly I say to you one of you will betray me the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, which now we know was John. He wrote it, but he didn't say, and it was me. But he goes, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that the disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Now we know that the table was basically about that high, and they would recline, and John is basically leaning on Jesus, and he's fine with it. In fact, so much so, when he writes the book here, he's saying, I just want you to know, I was the one laying next to Jesus. He, I loved him so much, and he loved me so much that he was fine with that. Nothing bad is going on. There's an interaction here that is it's pure, and it's like he knows he is loved by Jesus. I love this. I think our culture has twisted these things to make it, make, oh, I don't know about that. Okay, and by the way, we can't help it. We are born in America. In fact, so much so it impacts, look at John 21, 20 through 23. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. Look at that, the one who had been reclining at the table close to him. Boy, John brings it up again. He just wants you to know, I was right next to Jesus. He really likes me. He loves me. Isn't that cool? I don't know if you've ever been around anybody famous and you, we all, if you ever, hey, can I have a picture? I just saw the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Drew Brees is walking through. There's somebody, I see his people. Come on. I want a picture. Why? So that people would go, you knew Drew, you know Drew Brees, quarterback for the New Orleans Saints? I don't, do you feel that way about our Savior? I know Christ, the Son of the living God. And guess what? He likes me. He likes spending time with me. Mark 14, 43 through 45. How something could even be twisted. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And the word there, kissed, is he repeatedly kissed him. And nobody ever stopped in the middle of the context. Hey, th this is weird. It was Jesus received that affection. Here's my point. As we work through this together, and the title of the sermon is Sidious Altius Fortius, which is the... Um, Olympic, uh, Olympic uh, motto. 
First point, giving faster. We need to be people that are giving faster. Look at verse 1 quickly with me, verse 1 of chapter 20. After the uproar ceased, remember the mob in, in um, Ephesus where they were about to kill him, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them, and there's the picture there in there, that, that coming alongside here, this uproar was the riot from the last chapter, thoroughbus, uproar, same word Matthew used to describe the disturbance that took place during Pilate's trial of Jesus. Paul wants to meet with the disciples one more time before he leaves for Macedonia. So he calls them together. He says here, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. So he called them all together. And I want to say something that I see in this passage, because you could look at this and go, there's not a lot of theology here. There's There's a lot of narrative. There's a lot of telling us what's going on. But what do you see? Well, what I'm seeing is kind of in, if you look at the piece of paper there, it's kind of in the white spaces between the words. You ever hear that? I'm reading between the lines. I'm reading between the lines. This guy, this man Paul, cares affectionately for these people. He loves the church. God has called us to love the church. We gather around this table to acknowledge I love Christ. I love the Father. I love the Spirit of God. But ultimately, I have to love you. And guess what? you got to love me. And it's not just, I love you. And then you're grinding your teeth and you're, i got to see him maybe next week. Or somebody around you. And God says, Here's, I want you to have a, a passion for the church. I want you to love the church deeply. I'm so encouraged by people that love the church. Even people that have been hurt by the church. need to be giving faster. Secondly, Lee, I need to be looking higher. By the way, Sidious Altius Fortius means faster, higher, stronger. That's the Olympic motto. Point number two, looking higher. Look at verse two with me. When he had gone through these region, those regions and had given them much, them much encouragement, once again, he's investing in lives. He came to Greece He's going through Macedonia and Achaia, and he's giving much encouragement through teaching the word. He makes his way to Greece. He's not just, he's a person, and by the way, by the Spirit of God, we have this in us. Galatians tells me when I get saved, I have the fruit of the Spirit in me. Isn't that amazing? I've got love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, self-control. I've got it all. I talked to you about this before. There are people that you come in contact, you and I come in contact with, and you'll see them, and some people are so easy to love. I could go around this room, some of you are just so easy to love. It's like you just want to hug them right away. Then there's some people, not so much. It's work. Here's, here's the beauty of the fruit of the Spirit. He's given us, all things, even Dave Olson read that verse, he's given us all things already for godliness. Here's the problem. We don't believe him. We don't acknowledge this as a truth. And so if somebody comes, I come in contact with a person, I'm playing ball with them, boy, they bug me. I, I could say to God, God, Lord, give me a love for that idiot. Okay. <laughs> Here's what he, he, God would say to me. I already did. Would you just acknowledge it? So here's what you need to do. Don't pray, give me a love. Here's what you say. Lord, thank you that you give me a love for them. You're like, I don't get a love for them. I'm not talking about a feeling. You say, God, you told me you gave it. Now I want to act on it. I want to believe you. And I'm telling you, God shows up. And he'll get the glory. And then you, you, you can't explain it. I go, man, I actually love this person. I may even grow to like him. Verse 3. There he spent three months. And when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. After three months in the KI, most... Or all of it spent in Corinth, Paul faced danger from his countrymen. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 
2 Corinthians 11, 26. On frequent journeys, he's talking about this instance. In danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. He's writing this, and he's saying, this is what's going on. He, became, he becomes aware of this plot. These, these had not forgotten about the conversions of different individuals, and they were not going to let this continue. And this plot delayed Paul by depriving him of a direct sea route to Syria. But he's determined to return to Palestine through Macedonia. So I'm giving faster. I want to be looking higher. And lastly, point number three, I need to be bonding stronger. Bonding stronger. He did not travel alone. Look at verse 4. We need one another. Sopater, the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him. And of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby and Timothy and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These men were likely the official representatives of their churches, chosen to accompany Paul as he took the offering to Jerusalem. Isn't this interesting? That come alongside, there is, there is accountability even. You do know that when the offering is taken out of here, there's two people that count it. There's accountability. It's just understood. Um, Sopater would be representing Berea. Aristarchus and Secundus, he would, they'd be re, uh, representing Thessalonica. Gaius would be re representing Derby. Timothy representing Lystra. Tychicus and Trophimus representing Ephesus. And they're all traveling with him. Verse 5. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. This group apparently separated in Philippi since Luke notes that they were waiting at Troas. And he uses the first person plural with us in verse 5 and we in verse 6. Look at verse 6. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came uh, to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. In this narrative we see Paul's trip um, across the Aegean Sea from Troas to Neapolis and on the secondary missionary journey had only taken two days. This voyage, however, took five days, maybe because the winds were against him or maybe because he had to invest in people. People take time. And so I want to encourage you, as, as James was up here and he's talking about what we value, and by the way, we do need to get things done. Obviously, there's people that, there's doers and there's people that think a lot about doing. And we, and we do need to get things done. I understand that. But guess what? Those other nations get things done. Something I want to take from this, this context. Because you look at Paul. Paul was a person that was um, in the will of God. Paul was a person that got things done. That ultimately he, he could say, I've, I've run the race. I've finished the course. And the model that I see in him here is a model of investing in people. My family I invest in, I hope I have. I hope I've modeled that. I hope I, I, I've loved my children and my wife the way I ought. <laughs> But that's not all. There's others. How are we doing? I, I see the heart of God in this. It's not just a cultural thing. I think God's saying to people are important. 100 years from now, some of the things that we're building, they're important. But they're, they're going to be gone. And I'm going to just keep hammering this point. It's people. Love God. Love people. And in the midst of it, we're going to have a lot of things we're doing. But ultimately, what do we value? I want to be somebody that's faster and higher and stronger in a way that would honor God. Let's pray.